Picture a massive, clear lake. The water is calm, the weather is warm, and the sun is just slightly peeking above the tall, green, jagged mountains encircling the horizon to the east where your gaze is cast. On your right side, in the distance, a long, narrow railroad bridge stretches across the water to a track extending southward along the lake's far shore. Behind you, an expanse of bright green grass hosts a shady park with the sandy beach you're standing on. In front of you, a concrete breakwater, about the width of a sidewalk, runs out about 50 feet over the clear water. Walk forward along the narrow causeway. The water is so clean that you can see the sandy bottom receding from view and growing darker as you get further from shore. At the end of this narrow cement pier is a ten-foot-tall replica of the Statue of Liberty. She faces you. Someone has painted her left toenails a lively, pinkish-purple paisley pattern that a teenager might sport during flip-flop season. The dull green on her other toes has weathered away to reveal the gray metal body beneath Liberty's painted veneer. It is an August morning as pretty as you can imagine, in a place as fine as you would care to seek, and everything is right with the world. Let's begin. If you happen to be a neurotypical person, then you probably have a very nice mental image of the place I just described. You may even want to visit. If you're a skilled enough Googler, you may even be able to find that place I just described. That would be a heck of a telepathic feat. What is this, cognitively speaking? A minor miracle, I'd say. Not only that you can conjure a decent representative image of a place you've likely never been, but that all those cues came from a bunch of squiggly lines written on a page. It boggles the mind when you compare this feature of human thought with the millions of other animal species that don't even come close to anything resembling this ability. Where does this cognitive talent come from? Let's ignore the written component for a moment and get to the root of the cognitive trick here. We're going to go back to oral storytellers, and even beyond that as best we can, to the cognitive basis for narrative thought. This is going to involve another leap of imagination, some help from some friends and animals, and a bit of an open mind. Now, picture, if you will, a mammal-like creature, maybe a small one. Let's call it an ancestor. Its vision is probably very basic compared to ours, but it has a keen nose and can move very quickly. It's a predator and a scavenger. Today, it's on the hunt. Cognitively, it has the ability to remember places, to orient itself in the world, and likely to form a mental image of a new place in order to remember it. Its prey is a small leaf eater that really likes ferns. Our creature is following a trail it picked up when it first noticed a footprint in the mud. It then picked up its prey's scent. Since then, it has been following signs. More footprints, a strong odor, half-eaten fern fronds with little teeth marks in them. Memory tells our little hunter that a meal awaits it at the end of this trail with a little lock. What's in this creature's head as it examines these signs? It clearly has the ability to connect the footprint's odor and teeth marks in the leaves with its target. Can it see its prey in its mind's eye? Do these environmental signs cue the vision of a living animal munching away on ferns unsuspectingly? The ability to form mental imagery and map space is curiously found in the same brain area, the hippocampus. This area is also fundamental to multiple memory processes. Damage to this area of the brain results in an inability to process scenes and form new memories, as well as an ability to understand narratives. This is a curious and critical trifecta with our purposes in mind. So is our little hunter working through the rudimentary elements of a story? A quest narrative of sorts, with the goal of a full belly? I'd say yes. I'd also speculate that rudimentary imagery helps to facilitate its memory of its target and of its orientation in its environment. These are speculations, but they're well informed by modern neurological understanding of how the rodent brain works, and a little by how the human brain works. If you ask me where narrative began, I'd say here, long before any discernible spoken language was ever uttered. And if you asked me what the first stories were, I'd speculate that they were likely recountings of battles and hunts around proto-human campfires, told in grunts, pantomime, and single-word signifiers that recalled a shared experience of the hunters. I suspect that even the structure of sentences themselves are undergirded by the structure of narrative itself, with a cue, a constraint, and a resolution, such as, 
found sign of prey, followed trail, caught dinner, much like subject, verb, object. And from these first rudimentary stories, which proved useful enough to give our ancestors a competitive advantage, more words and more complex stories were formed. And one useful advantage this talent gave our ancestors was the ability to convey to fellow tribe members the features of their environment and the potential threats and dangers lurking therein. Croc in water. Lions near. Enemy coming. Near Eagle Rock. Slowly, signifiers like these got used for many other purposes. The connection between memory, imagery, and stories is compelling. Scene construction, the ability to form mental images, is both a critical component of comprehending stories and a time-tested technique for improving memory. Speakers in preliterate societies, including some very notable Greek and Roman orators, use both image-based mnemonic techniques and mental maps to remember and recall vast amounts of information, techniques that modern memory champions still use today. One of the most useful and reliable of these techniques is the root method, a tactic where a person places visual images of new information on a mental map they're already intimately familiar with, which allows the person to mentally walk back through the root and recall the new information placed there. For example, if you've lived in your current house or apartment for longer than a month, you've internalized a mental map of this environment. Close your eyes and walk through the front door. What's in that first space as you walk inside? Coat hangers, a shoe rack, a table where you keep your keys in a little basket, maybe a closet? I don't know what your place looks like, but I can picture mine from the front door all the way to the attic. By developing mnemonic images that accompany new information, I can mentally place each new image at a point on the mental map of my house and recall it simply by imagining a walk through this well-known territory. So what does this have to do with stories? Maybe nothing directly, maybe a lot. Some of what we know about the bardic storytellers, the Homers, Hesiods, and Chaucers, comes from Milman Parry, a scholar of Homeric poetry, who revealed the use of formulaic phrases in Homer that indicate the epics were composed as oral stories that were roughly memorized and then performed slightly differently each time until they were finally written down, perhaps hundreds of years later, after they were first sung. These techniques, which include things like formulaic type scenes and recurring descriptions of characters, are still in use among Slavic bards, who tell the same long stories slightly differently each time. A modern reader, looking at the Iliad or the Odyssey, might consider it a nearly supernatural task to recite the entire epic, as the ancient Greek storytellers supposedly did over several days. It would require a seemingly impossible feat of memory to perform such a monumental task, at first glance. But, armed with certain tools at their disposal, mnemonic visualization, formulaic descriptions, type scenes, and epithets, a bard, could realistically build a massive memory route that contained the entirety of Homer's epics. I personally became intrigued by the idea of improving my retention of knowledge right as I was considering graduate school. To test the techniques I learned from world memory champion Christine Stenger's book, A Sheep Falls Out of a Tree, I decided to memorize a list of vocabulary words I gathered from various GRE prep books. In a span of about six weeks, with a lot of effort and discipline, I was able to memorize a list of 2,500 words, and on the day I sat for the exam, if you had about eight hours to listen, I could have run through the entire list in order without missing a single word. I also don't think it's an accident that the Homeric epics and these mnemonic techniques both come down to us from the same culture. Scholars have speculated about the training of ancient bards as a long apprenticeship, and along with the belief that these bards traveled the countryside performing their epic tales, it would follow that these bards would have had massive mental maps of various different landscapes from which to draw. I could easily picture a master poet retracing territory on the way from one town to another, schooling his successor on the events and descriptions that unfold at each place on a large mental map containing snippets of the foundational tales in their tradition. Given what I was able to memorize in six weeks, I could easily see a lifetime's application of building a vast mental landscape of the Homeric epics, resulting in a skilled poet being able to perform the works from memory on command. 
but is a text a map, and what does that have to do with space in the story world? And, more importantly, how can any of this make you a better writer? The answer to question one, is a text a map, is no, a text is not a map. But as we discussed before, visual imagery and mental mapping take place in the same brain area. They're closely related, and they're vital to a reader's ability to process a story. The narratologist Mary Laura Ryan explored the relationship between stories and mapping of a story world space in perhaps the most interesting exploration of story and space I've ever read. She had a group of high school students read Gabriel Garcia Marquez's novel, Chronicle of a Death Foretold, and then had them draw a map of the fictional town where the story unfolded. Their maps varied tremendously, much in the same way the maps would vary if you asked these same students to draw a map of their hometown. But the maps all had similar features, and all the students seemed to be able to place certain landmarks, like the protagonist's house, the river, and the church, into a spatial relationship with one another. Ryan points out that this spatial relationship is necessary. Otherwise, how would a reader be able to imagine the character movements necessary for a dynamic story world? One of the most interesting results in her experiment was that the maps were filled with mistakes and contradictions, indicating that the reader, though they must be putting that space in the story world into some sort of spatial relationship for the purposes of scene construction, they largely aren't trying to recreate an accurate map of the story world space. Ryan noted that, quote, The novel offered more spatial information than my memory could hold, and the mapping activity would not have been possible without a piece of paper. So it seems that a reader would likely only be using the spatial information at hand to visualize the present scene. This will likely result in representations that are inaccurate or contradictory without the reader ever being aware of these inaccuracies. Ryan also contrasted the differing perspectives of the maps. On the one hand, a flat view from above, with, on the other hand, pictorial elements some of her students placed in their representations. A modern-day metaphor would be the difference between map view and street view on Google Maps, with the former representing the landscape viewed from above and the latter dropping the viewer into the observer's perspective. The reader's perspective, though it may implicitly involve generating a story space map, isn't a literal mapping of space. Rather, it seems to be the creation of an episodic sequence of images envisioned from a certain viewpoint. The totality of a story, experienced in this way, functions more like a temporal mosaic of imagined scenes that the reader implicitly cobbles together into a story world. How fun! And very lucky for us writers. Here's why. You don't have to be a cartographer to be a writer. You don't have to hire an architect to lay out your character's floor plan. Nor do you need to have a collection of maps on your desk, like you'd find in the front pages of various adventure stories, like Lord of the Rings, Treasure Island, A Song of Ice and Fire, or the map of the Star Wars galaxy, where you can figure out how many light years it is from Endor to Hoth. These artifacts may help some geographically inclined readers to enjoy big stories, but they clearly aren't critical. Experiencing a story spatially is a bit like being dropped into a new town unexpectedly. Different people are going to map that new space in different ways, some more clearly and more successfully than others. But, unless they have some kind of neurological impairment, they're going to map that space, implicitly and involuntarily. And unless authorial errors are ridiculous and glaring, the reader will likely never notice that the geography of the story world hasn't been surveyed with a compass, a level, and a plumb. The telepathic game is a cooperative game, and the construction of space is one element where the reader does the bulk of the work for you. Readers bring a lot of creative force to the table in this regard. The great news for the modern writer is that the cognitive revolution of the last 40 years has taught us a lot about how people process spatial relations and form mental imagery and map space. Narrative theorists have taken notice and they've used a lot of this new information to study how texts organize spatial cues for readers. We're going to examine how the spatial cues in stories can be either vivid and immersive, or vague and disorienting. Both can be effective in generating a desired experience for your reader. We'll look at how your readers build expectations for common scenarios based on place, and we'll explore how to effectively invite your reader onto the scene of your story world, 
and how to push them out of it if you choose to do so. We'll briefly look at the role objects play in stories, and we'll explore the common elements of memorable images that seem to last in a reader's memory long after they've finished reading. All this, I think, stems from an evolved memory that long precedes language. This is the cognitive trick that makes stories possible. It can take you to a prehistoric village, a futuristic space station, or to the center of New York City, all in the span of a few words. Or it can bring you back to that clear lake with me on that cement causeway with Lady Liberty staring back at you on a sunny morning I remember well, when a bald eagle glided silently over the water and a freight train clicked its way south over the long bridge into the green mountains on the other side. <laughs>